So welcome to the this afternoon's session of the um, Night and Festival. And we are very, very pleased to have a very special guest um, today in the form of Martin Rees, as you can see. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if uh, you, it's just my that I happen to know you, Martin, that um, we're very grateful that you could spare the time to talk to us. I'm yeah. only sorry that you can't be here in person. Uh, but it's a long, difficult journey across um, from Cambridge, I know. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, Martin Rees is the Astronomer Royal, and as a journalist myself, he is a very media-friendly Astronomer Royal. Um, I'm delighted to say that almost every time I've wanted to interview him, whether it's been on um, exploding stars, supermassive black holes, the origin of our universe, or the possibility of a multiverse. He's always been there with a nice, understandable interview. And I was very pleased also to be able to be on the production team when he gave the Wreath Lectures. Um, must be about 12 years ago now, I'm guessing. Um, but um, he has held practically every high office in science. He's been president of the Royal Society, master of Trinity College, the director of the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Um, so anything that isn't known about the universe, <laughs> um, he, he's uh, just a wonderful person to have here. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've um, managed to bring any um, alien life, but um, we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Martin. Yes. Well, uh, thank you, Martin. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Hearing you loud and clear, thank you. you are. Okay. Um, well, um, uh, let me just say, I'm sorry not to be with you in person because uh, it would be nice to see some friends, but uh, night is only seven miles from the village where I grew up. So I always like the chance to come back to the environment of uh, Shropshire, Radishow and Herefordshire. And sadly, I couldn't make it this weekend, so I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm especially sorry also because I know there is a lot of interest in astronomy and uh, there's been a dark skies campaign in Prestine, um, which has been very successful. And I'd like to start off uh, by uh, just uh, um, ex just saying why. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my, my slides to work. Yep. Uh, and um, I'd like to start off um, by saying um, why I so much welcome dark skies campaigns. It's really because the dark sky is part of our environment. And indeed, it's a special part of our environment. It's one part which has been observed by all humans all over the world throughout human history. So it's the one thing which we have above all else in common. And it's therefore very sad uh, that uh, many young people grow up um, living in built up areas where they never really see a dark sky. And that's why I am involved in various dark skies campaigns. There's been one for the Brecon Beacons and it's good that there's one uh, uh, around your area. Um, and it's, it's important uh, to enable people more easily to actually experience a dark sky. And the point I'd like to make in particular is it's not just astronomers who should care about this. Um, uh, it's, it's something which everyone should care about. <clears throat> and uh, young people should see the dark sky just as they see a bird's nest. And to give an example, in my case, um, I am not an ornithologist, but I would sadly miss the songbirds in my garden if they disappeared. And likewise, many people who wouldn't claim to be especially interested in astronomy, they certainly do miss not seeing a clear dark sky and that's why it's very important that we should um, encourage these dark skies campaigns plus of course the fact that they save energy and have other benefits as well 
Well, leading on from that, uh, as I've indicated, um, astronomy is something that's uh, um, been wondered about by people throughout human history. Uh, so astronomy is, in fact, um, uh, a very old human pursuit. Um, probably, um, in fact, the oldest science, except perhaps for medicine, and at the risk of offending any medics who may be in the audience today, I would say it was the first science that did more good than harm. Uh, that's because, of course, millennia ago, uh, astronomy was important in defining the calendar and, of course, in timekeeping ever since. I'm not going to go back that far, but I am going to go back um, a few centuries <clears throat> and uh, um, talk about um, uh, what happened in the 17th century. This is Trinity College, where I work, and this view would have looked essentially the same uh, in the 1660s, um, which is when uh, we in our college had our best ever student, this man here, Isaac Newton. And uh, he famously um, went away from uh, Cambridge for a year during the plague in 1665, and according to legend, that's when he saw a falling apple, which led him to realize that the force that makes the apple fall is the same as the force that holds the moon in its orbit around the Earth and the Earth in its orbit around the sun. Well, we shut down our college just two years ago. The students went home, but none sadly came back with any great new idea, at least not to my knowledge. But Newton, of course, <clears throat> Uh, did so many things. Um, uh, this is a picture of his telescope, a replica of the, the telescope in the Science Museum. Um, but he also thought about space travel. And this is an illustration from his famous book, The Principia. Uh, it shows, as you can see, um, the trajectories of cannonballs being fired from a mountaintop. And the faster they're fired, the further they go, and if they're fired at the right speed, then their trajectory curves downwards no more steeply than the Earth curves away underneath it. It goes into a circular orbit. You can see that happening. This is still, I think, the neatest way to explain to young students the concept of orbital flight. And Newton uh, realized this, that he calculated that to go into this circular orbit, the cannonball has to be fired at about 18,000 miles an hour, far beyond, of course, what was possible for the artillery of his time. And again, as people probably know, it wasn't until 1957 that the first object was launched into orbit around the Earth. This was the Soviet Sputnik 1. This was followed by some dogs that were sent into space, and then four years later by Yuri Gagarin, the first uh, human to go into orbit. And uh, Gagarin uh, became a great celebrity. Uh, he came to London and uh, um, was um, mobbed by large crowds, but the uh, Prime Minister then Harold of Millen, who was an old cynic, he said it would have been twice as bad if they'd sent the dog. Anyway, he was a great hero, as were all the early astronauts. But it was only eight years after Gagarin that we had these pictures. This is a picture taken by um, uh, Apollo 7, Ed Anders, um, orbiting the moon, showing the um, uh, Earth with delicate biosphere, contrasting with the sterile moonscape on which uh, uh, a few months later, the first astronaut, Neil Armstrong, placed his footprints. That was an iconic picture, of course, for environmentalists to see uh, the Earth as a whole from far away. Well, this was 1969 um, when the first moon landing occurred. And uh, this picture was signed for me just a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. Um, there were 14 uh, altogether. Uh, seven of them uh, signed this picture. Um, and it's a memento which I challenge. But this was all a long time ago. Younger people in the audience today will regard this as ancient history, or my students do. They know that the Americans landed people on the moon. They know the Egyptians built pyramids. These both seem 
ancient history uh, motivated by rather strange national goals. And it was all over within two and a half years. Uh, this was um, uh, Messrs. Uh, uh, Schmidt and Kernan in Apollo 17, this little moon buggy, and they returned to the Earth in uh, December 1972. And since that time, um, no one has been further than low Earth orbit. Many hundreds have done that, mainly in the International Space Station, shown here. But that's a bit of a come down after uh, going to the moon. And I think it's fair to say that um, uh, the astronauts who go to the space station don't really attract interest. It uh, doesn't get much publicity in the press unless something goes wrong. Like, say, the loo doesn't work, it doesn't work or something like that. Or when astronauts do stunts, like uh, Chris Hatfield, the Canadian astronaut who uh, played his guitar and sang David Bowie songs. So it's not very inspiring uh, to have um, uh, uh, humans going in this low Earth orbit. But of course, although that's all that's happened in human spaceflight, there's been a huge amount of progress in space technology. And we now, uh, of course, as we all know, depend every day on space technology for sat-nav, communications, uh, weather forecasting, etc. And of course, uh, science benefits because we can put telescopes up above the blurring and absorption effects of the Earth's atmosphere, um, including most recently James Webb Telescope, which I'll come back to again later in the talk. <clears throat> but um, there has also been exploration by robots, not by people, of our solar system. Indeed, uh, plan spacecraft have been and given close-up pictures or even landed on all the major bodies of our solar system. Let me just show you a few pictures. Uh, let's imagine you are being launched on a voyage to the outer solar system. Um, this will be the most uncomfortable stage, uh, being actually launched in a rocket. Um, but if you look back from, say, 10 million miles away, you see something like this. This is the Earth and the Moon with the sun shining from the right-hand side. When you get a bit further, you will get to the red planet, Mars. And quite a number of space probes have either landed on Mars or gone into orbit around it. So we now know quite a, a lot about Mars. <clears throat> um, let me just show you, this is the Curiosity probe, which was uh, uh, landed on Mars um, about 12 years ago now, uh, in the middle of a huge crater. And since that time, it's been trundling very slowly across the crater. And in this picture, if you look carefully, a quarter of the way up, you can see that the, the track marks made by uh, uh, Curiosity as it moves across Mars. This is taken from a, another spacecraft orbiting Mars. And uh, subsequently, um, there's been Perseverance. This is a... a uh, a more modern version of a rover, again about the size of a small car, but this had enough uh, um, artificial intelligence built in that um, if it encountered a rock, it didn't need to report back to base um, to get instructions. It could figure out how to go um, around by itself and therefore it could move faster. And incidentally, within 10 or 20 years, um, the um, robots will be able to uh, um, uh, have enough intelligence to do the geology and figure out what's a specially exciting place to dig and get a sample which can be brought back to Earth. Let me show you a few pictures taken of the outer planets. Oh, this is a, a Chinese probe on the, uh, on Mars, which landed last year. Um, you can't get the feature of the same. This is actually about the size of a small car again. Um, and uh, this is this is again trundling around. You see, we've got caterpillar tracks. But if you go further out, then you encounter the giant of the solar system, which is Jupiter. And Jupiter has many moons, um, and it has complicated weather. Um, this is a um, picture taken by um, uh, a, a, an American spacecraft called Juno of the North Pole 
of Jupiter, lots of complicated cyclones there, so very complicated weather patterns. And these are the four moons of Jupiter discovered by Galileo, um, all very different. Um, Io, surface of volcanic, um, Europa, um, covered in ice. <laughs> and these have been studied close up. And then, going further out, we get to Saturn and the probe Cassini. I went to Saturn and spent 13 years in the Saturnian system, uh, taking pictures and getting close-ups of some of the moons. It took this rather special picture. Um, this shows an eclipse of the sun by Saturn. Cassini was beyond Saturn, lined up at such a distance that Saturn just covered the face of the sun, blocking it out, but the sun is still sh shining on the rings of Saturn. And at the end of that arrow, you can't quite see it on this picture, but that's where the Earth is, looking very faint from this great distance. Saturn has some very interesting moons. Um, this is Titan, uh, on which an, a European probe uh, called Huygens landed. Uh, this is a picture taken uh, from just above its surface. It looks rather nice with these little lakes, but these lakes are lakes of liquid methane, not of hydrogen, not of water, um, and the temperature is minus 106 degrees centigrade, so it's not a very clement uh, place to be. And this is another moon with Saturn, Enceladus, a smaller moon, which is covered in ice, and onto this ice we have good reason to believe there's a liquid ocean, and sometimes spray comes up through the, um, uh, um, uh, to, through the vents in the ice. And it's hoped that there will be another probe going to study this more, more carefully. Cassini got some fairly close-up pictures uh, like this. Well, just one more, I think. Oh, this is um, Pluto, uh, which was uh, uh, taken by the um, uh, American New Horizon probe. I'd like to mention that um, uh, the New Horizon probe and Cassini both took about 10 years to get to their destinations, um, and uh, um, they were therefore built in the early 2000s for designs from the 1990s. And if you think how our mobile phones and smartphones have improved in the last 20 years, think how much better we could do today in designing small probes to go to the outer solar system. And I can well imagine that in the next decades, there will be whole flotillas of tiny robotic probes which will be getting close-ups of all these um, locations and uh, probably landing on the surface, maybe even mining under the ice of Enceladus and Europa. That would be very exciting. But um, what about the role of humans? Will there be a revival of human spaceflight uh, inspirational in this way that Apollo was? <clears throat> there, there is, as you may know, a plan called Artemis to send humans back to the moon um, later this decade. That's very expensive, of course. Um, but then there's also talk about sending humans to Mars 20 or 30 years from now. And this is really, really hard um, because it's a six month journey and you've got to send um, people in a safe capsule with six months of provision. And moreover, you've got to send with them or have sent in advance all the facilities for the return trip. This means a launch ship on the surface of Mars, etc. Hugely more, hugely expensive, um, and uh, probably hundreds of times more expensive than just sending robotic probes, uh, which can do all the science, etc., uh, and just report back. They don't eat anything on the voyage, and they can go just as easily to Jupiter as going to, uh, to Mars. So uh, there's uh, um, an argument which is presented in a book that I wrote with a colleague called Don Goldsmith, published a few months ago, called The End of Astronauts. And this is really saying um, why we think that robots and not humans are the future of space exploration. Essentially, it's very, very expensive to send people on a long journey in space, um, and uh, it's very risky. And uh, NASA is now very risk averse. Of course, the original Apollo astronauts accepted high risks, but the um, uh, 
um, people who've gone up in the space shuttle to the space station, um, they've uh, been rather risk averse because the shuttle was launched 135 times and there were two crashes when the seven people in the shuttle were killed. Uh, and this was one was in the late 1980s, one of the early 1990s. Um, and uh, these were traumatic for the Americans and they caused a big uh, delay in the program and attempts to reduce the risk still further. But the 2% risk, that's two failures in 135 launches, is acceptable to uh, adventurers and test pilots and people. So what Don Goldsmith and I say in our book <clears throat> is that human spaceflight <clears throat> should be left to um, the billionaires, um, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, who, who as you know, are building uh, spacecraft to be launched into space carrying humans, um, because they can take the kind of people prepared to accept high risks, maybe even a one-way trip uh, to Mars. There are certainly people who would go with a one-way trip, and in fact, Elon Musk himself has said that he uh, hopes to die on Mars, but not on impact. And he's now 51, I think, so 40 years from now, uh, he may do this. And good luck to him. But I think this has to be presented as cut price, high risk adventure. The word space tourism, as used by Virgin Atlantic, is a big mistake because that implies it's routine and the first accident uh, will then uh, uh, be an unexpected disaster from their perspective. You've got to say it's a high risk venture and launch only the kind of people prepared to uh, accept the risk which the Apollo astronauts took and which Scott of the Antarctic and the classic explorers took but we should cheer them on. But one respect in which I disagree with Musk is that he and certain other people, including my late colleague Stephen Hawking, think that these pioneers on Mars will be the uh, precursors of mass emigration. They talk about millions of people going to Mars to escape the Earth's problems. Now, this is a dangerous delusion First of all, Mars, as it is now, is far less comfortable than living at the South Pole, the ocean bed, or the top of Everest. And dealing with climate change on Earth, though as we know it's a big challenge, is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. So we've got to accept that there's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. We've got to cherish our earthly home. Nonetheless, if there are a few crazy adventurers living in some little colony on Mars, as there may well be by the end of the century, I think we should cheer them on. And let me explain why I think that. They will, of course, have access to uh, technology of uh, genetic modification, cyborg te technology, leading, linking themselves with, with uh, electronic enhancements and things like that which of course are being prepared and talked about. All those techniques are going to be, one hopes, regulated on Earth for prudential and ethical reasons. And of course, we are adapted to the Earth, we don't need them, but these people on Mars are very ill-adapted to where they are. Uh, the atmosphere is completely wrong for them, the gravity is wrong, etc. And so they'd be away from the regulators, so they will use all these uh, technologies that will develop in the rest of the century to modify their progeny to adapt to this very hostile environment. And within a few centuries, they may have become in effect a new species. Very rapid evolution, um, simply by designing uh, um, th their successes. And um, this of course may lead to them becoming fully um, electronic not flesh and blood at all. And of course, if they're electronic, then they may not want to be on the planet at all because they won't need an atmosphere. They may prefer zero G. And if they're near immortal, they will not be discouraged by long voyages. So one scenario is that a, a few hundred years from now, the descendants of these brave pioneers on Mars uh, will be embarking on interstellar voyages. And of course, um, there's plenty of time lying ahead and they can perhaps uh, um, 
colonize the um, the galaxy. And um, uh, this this leads me to uh, make a remark about time scales. This is um, uh, a time chart which everyone's familiar with about uh, evolution on the Earth over the last four billion years or so. The first life developed. We don't know uh, how the first life developed, um, but once it got started, then Darwinian evolution, as we know, uh, led very slowly, but over billions of years, <clears throat> to the complex biosphere where part of and which we see around us. Now, most people accept this. If you live in Kentucky or part of the Muslim world, you perhaps don't, but most people accept that. But even those who accept this story tend to think that we humans are the culmination of the process, the top of the tree. And no astronomer can believe that. And the reason is that we know that the sun which has been around for four and a half million years, has enough fuel for another six billion years. It's less than halfway through its life. And the galaxy and the universe may have a far longer future ahead of it, even than that, maybe even infinite. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. So uh, we may as humans, be not even the halfway stage in the emergence of ever more marvellous complexity in our galaxy. And uh, um, it could be that uh, if we are the only advanced life, uh, then um, um, we will um, uh, green the entire galaxy. We have plenty of time to do that. And of course, um, if there are entities around when the sun dies, the sun will flare up like in the picture. And if there's some entities there to send a postcard, um, they won't be like us. They'll be as different from us as we are from slime mold, for instance, completely different. We just can't conceive what kind of entities might exist in this stage. Hmm. Well, what I've said now indicates that uh, uh, if we don't screw up and destroy life this century, uh, then it's possible for our remote descendants to spread through the galaxy. But this begs the question, which uh, everyone asks quite rightly, is there life out there already? Or is the rest of the galaxy awaiting our remote progeny? And uh, this question, of course, is completely uncertain now. We don't know whether it's likely or unlikely because uh, we don't know how the first life on Earth started. We know that, um, uh, as I said, simple life evolves by doing its selection, but the transition from complex chemistry to the first metabolizing, reproducing entities we call alive, that's still not understood. And that's fascinating to the most earthbound biologists. Uh, there, and therefore, we can't yet say whether the origin of life involved a rare fluke or whether it's something which would have happened anywhere where there was an environment like the environment on the young earth. And this leads to uh, my next topic, which is uh, to talk about the places where life might exist and might have formed. I should first mention that um, uh, there could be some very simple life um, under the oceans of uh, uh, Europa or Enceladus, we don't know, but we're fairly sure there's no very complicated life, even complicated vegetation, anywhere in our solar system. But the whole situation was transformed uh, in the last 20 years by the realization that when we look beyond our solar system to the realm of the stars, most of the stars are orbited by retinues of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. And this uh, discovery um, was first made about 25 years ago. Um, and uh, this is a picture of my Cambridge colleague, Didier Kello, who two years ago got the Nobel Prize for having discovered the first um, exoplanet around an ordinary star. He's looking very cheerful there, but he's gone on to discover many hundreds of exoplanets. 
There are various techniques, but the main technique for discovering exoplanets, which are rather like the Earth, is not to detect them directly, which is very hard at the moment, but to detect the effect they have when they transit across the face of a star. And uh, if you imagine that we are looking close to the plane of an orbit, and you imagine a planet going around, then it'll go across the face of the star and, and, and then disappear around the back. And just on this very simple picture, suppose you're looking at the star, then if a planet transit across, it will block out a bit of the light. And so if you imagine the brightness of the star, then this, that will dip. And the depth of the dip tells you how big the planet is compared to the star. And the interval between successive dips tells you the length of the planet's year. And by this technique, uh, many thousands of planets have been inferred. Incidentally, uh, the Earth's about 1% the diameter of the Sun. That's 1 ten thousandth of the area. So if an alien were looking from a long way away at the Sun, seeing as the point of light, they would get dimmer by one part in 10,000 uh, once a year. <clears throat> this uh, spacecraft called Kepler, Kepler um, launched by NASA, has a telescope which looked at a patch of sky about seven degrees across and measured the brightness of 100,000 stars in that part of the sky very precisely. To precision of one part in 100,000, looking for transits, looking for regular dimmings, indicating that a planet was moving across. And, and it found evidence for thousands, and doing the statistics of the number it looked at, uh, it, it, it's been possible to infer that... Let me, let me just... Yeah. <laughs> Almost every star has a planet around it, and about one star in six has a planet rather like the Earth and a star in what's called a habitable zone, which is a, a, the distance from the parent star such that water can exist, neither boiling away nor staying frozen. So there are many stars which could have life on them in the sense that they were rather like the young Earth. Um, if I can get if I can get back to it, um, uh, I wanted to show this. This is a very unusual planetary system which has been inferred, where um, it's been inferred that there are seven planets orbiting this uh, star. And this is a very faint star. The star is only 1% as bright as the sun, very small and faint. And so it's a miniature solar system, as it were. There are seven planets going around, and the planets are uh, in orbits, and the close closest one has a year which is just one and a half of our days and even the outermost one has a year which is about um, two or three of our weeks so it's a miniature solar system um, the outer three of these planets are in a habitable zone in the sense that they um, uh, are at a temperature where water could exist but they may be not very good places for, uh, for, for life um, if they had aliens on them uh, then um, uh, they, they live a strange life because uh, one reason is that um, these planets um, they are tightly locked. So just as the moon always presents its same face to the Earth, for the same reason, these planets would present the same face to the star. So uh, half of the planet will be in perpetual starlight, half in perpetual darkness. So there'd be a kind of apartheid where everyone would be in the bright half, except the astronomers uh, in the in the dark side, far away. But this is a, just one of the exotic range of planetary systems that have that have been found. Well, <clears throat> as I said, these planets uh, haven't been detected directly. They've been detected um, and inferred by their effect on the brightness of the parent star. We can infer how big they are and what their year is. But because we really like to detect them. And that's very difficult. So let me explain how difficult that is. Suppose there were some aliens 
out there with a big telescope looking back at us. Then <clears throat> if they were say 50 light years away, then the sun would look like an ordinary star. And the earth would look in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, like a pale blue dot, very close in the sky to its star, our sun, but billions of times fainter. But if they had a big enough telescope that they could actually observe and analyze the light from that pale blue dot, they could infer quite a bit about the Earth. Because, for instance, the shade of blue would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia was facing them. So they could infer the continents and oceans, they could infer the length of our day, they could infer something about the uh, uh, seasons and the climate. <clears throat> and by analyzing the spectrum of the light, they could infer there was lots of vegetation. Well, we can't do that yet, but with uh, new telescopes, this may be possible. Um, the uh, James Webb telescope, which has been launched, uh, may be able to detect uh, um, a few bright planets around nearby stars and learn something about their atmosphere. Do they have oxygen? Do they have chlorophyll, etc.? cetera? Um, and that's going to be one of the very exciting outcomes of the James Webb telescope. Um, but a slightly better chance will happen in a few years' time on the ground. <clears throat> And this is a picture of a telescope which is being built uh, at the moment on the top of a mountain in Chile. And it's being built by a consortium of European astronomers, European countries, um, and despite Brexit, Britain is still in this consortium, fortunately. It's the European Southern Observatory Consortium. And um, the Europeans aren't very imaginative in their nomenclature. Um, it's called the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope. And it is indeed extremely large. Um, its main mirror is 39 meters across. It's not one sheet of glass. It's a mosaic of 800 sheets of glass. But that connects and connects enough light that uh, if it looked at a planet like the Earth around a nearby star, it could get enough light to analyze. And so when this telescope is operating, as it will be within about five years, uh, that may give us a greater hope of finding some evidence for um, the life and um, the vegetation um, in uh, a uh, solar system, a stellar system, rather like our solar system. And that, of course, will be a hugely exciting development. But of course, what's even more exciting, and this is the question that one is asked, is, is there anywhere in our galaxy, not just life, not just uh, vegetation or algae or things like that, but intelligent life? the aliens of science fiction. And here again, we don't know. But of course, this is a uh, question where some people think they do know the answer. Indeed, um, I get uh, letters from people who say um, um, that they've met the aliens, they've been abducted by the aliens. And uh, uh, I write back and I say, um, do you really think that if the aliens have made a huge effort to traverse into stellar space and get to the Earth, would they just have met one or two well-known cranks? Maybe made a, uh, a few uh, corn circles and then gone away again. It seems unlikely. And I also tell these people they should write to each other and not write back to me. And that's worked in the past. So I think we don't yet have any evidence for technological life. Um, but of course, it's as well as looking for um, simple vegetation on the planet, it's worth, of course, spending some effort um, looking for evidence for something artificial. And uh, there are programs. If, in fact, I chair a program that's um, uh, bankrolled by a, uh, uh, a Russian billionaire in California um, to improve the searches for uh, transmissions that are manifestly artificial. Um, he, he's brought time on big grade telescopes and uh, uh, build special instruments. And um, I think uh, this is uh, the, the money he's spending. It's about $10 million a year, which is not big in the context of big science, but it's very good that he's spending his money on this rather than on a football team or a big yacht or something like that. Um, uh, but we don't hold our breath for success, but it's very 
worthwhile because it would be such a colossal discovery, obviously, if we found that uh, uh, there was uh, other advanced intelligence. And in the question period, I'm happy to say a bit more about what that would be like. But um, just um, before uh, finishing, um, let me just uh, make a few more uh, more remarks. Um, uh, people often ask, what do astronomers bring that's relevant to their attitude to life on Earth and to everyday life? And I have to say that um, Contrary to what some people might say, uh, we are astronomers are not especially serene and calm. Uh, we tend to just worry about minor things just as much as anyone else. But I think we do have a special perspective, which is perhaps helpful. And I already alluded to this. It's the perspective that there is a vast future ahead. Most people are aware of the vast geological past and the evolutionary past, but as I said, uh, they are not so aware that we may be not even a halfway stage and there's far more to come. And I think astronomers are uh, more aware of, of this. And the effect it, it has, this is, here's the picture again, which shows the, um, the last four billion years, but uh, on the right-hand side, this continues at least as far. And uh, uh, we are just one century in this history. Um, but the point I want to make, which does uh, link in to more everyday affairs, um, is that um, the Earth's been around for 45 million centuries, four and a half billion years. And as I said, it'll be another 60 million centuries, six billion years before the sun dies. But even in this Constantine of perspectives, stretching millions of centuries in both the past and the future, this century is special. It's special because it's the first when one species, the human species, has the future of the planet in its hands. This is for two reasons. First, there are enough of us and we are using enough in the way of energy and resources that we are changing the entire biosphere. And secondly, we developed technology so powerful that if misused, uh, they could uh, destroy us all. So this is a crucial century, um, which uh, if not handled carefully, um, will uh, snuff out the huge potential of the many millions of centuries coming later. And I think this is... Uh, uh, longer term thinking than most people are used to, but it strengthens uh, one's concern uh, to ensure that we do use uh, technologies to make our world safer and avoid these uh, catastrophic dangers. Uh, so uh, I think uh, with, with, with that thought, uh, the thought that we should uh, conserve our present planet as a very special habitat, uh, maybe I will finish now and hopefully leave some time for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Martin. You've uh, given us a whirlwind tour of a lot of worlds there. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. Uh, maybe I can, um, shall we risk Welsh broadband and put our camera on so you can see that there are actually people here? It'll uh, be nice, yes. Uh, yeah. I didn't before. Let's, yeah. let's click on that. I'll just click on the, on that. It's really, it's really. Oh. Oh, yes, I can, I can see you. Yes. I'm Martin. Hello. Hello. <laughs> there, there are other people here. <laughs> oh. Yes. No. Oh. yes. Um, I wonder if I can have the privilege of the first question. Um, you've shown, you know, as Carl Sagan would say, um, um, hundreds of billions of stars with tens of billions of planets. 
and I know your friends in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, have been scanning billions of radio frequencies for thousands of stars without coming up with anything terribly conclusive. Um, putting the um, people who've been abducted to one side, we haven't got evidence for technological civilization. That seems a bit surprising, doesn't it? Well, it, it depends what you expect. And let me expand on what I said. Um, uh, well, let's suppose that there was um, another planet where life had evolved in the same way as it has done on the Earth, okay, uh, evolving for um, four billion years into a flesh and blood civilization with technology like ours, and perhaps going on for another um, four billion years um, uh, in a quite different way. Um, either the other planet will be way ahead of ours, or it'll be behind ours. Uh, technological civilization will probably only last a few thousand years, and but that's um, less than a millionth of the time it might take. It might take, and there could be a another planet which lagged behind by a billion years, and therefore we would not see anything. But there could also be other planets which have um, uh, had a head start of a billion years. And so what, what would they be like? Um, they might have gone through the phase that we are now in a billion years ago, and they would uh, be in some different phase. And uh, what I said about the future on Earth gave some clues, because I think I said that within a few centuries, um, flesh and blood humans could have been replaced by um, electronic entities who would then go on into, into space being near immortal and not needing an atmosphere. And of course, they could survive for billions of years. So the way I would see it is that um, there's about four billion years before any kind of technology or intelligence emerges, and then maybe only a few thousand years during which you have a technology of flesh and blood creatures like ours. But then their legacy is these ele electronic entities which would then exist. And so uh, the, the message of this is that it's rather unlikely that we would catch the um, uh, entities on the other world in that stage when they are flesh and blood civilization. Either they haven't got as far as that or they've got beyond it. Mm -hmm. And what we would detect would be their um, uh, electronic progeny. So my view is that if SETI detects anything artificial, it'll be some something, some some burping electronic entity, which is the legacy of some long dead flesh and blood civilization, or maybe some uh, a very super intelligent electronic entity, which doesn't wish to communicate very much. So um, w whereas biological evolution is motivated and incentivizes two qualities. One is aggression and the other is intelligence. The sort of future evolution of post-humans will not be natural selection. It'll be what I like to call secular intelligent design. And, um, uh, and so it's not at all obvious that these entities will be aggressive. And so there may be these super intelligent electronic brains just thinking deep thoughts out in space and not making themselves manifest. So I think um, we can't prove that intelligence is rare in the universe um, because we'd only be able to detect this tiny fraction that's in this phase when it's conspicuous. And, um, uh, and so, although it's still true, as you say, that it could be that we're unique in having evolved this far, there could be lots of other uh, planets where things have evolved maybe even further than us. So it's worth a search, I think, to look for anything manifestly artificial. Um, uh, 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 obviously, some optical or radio transmission or some <clears throat> massive artifact. And it's worth looking for strange artifacts in our solar system. This may sound like science fiction, like 2001, etc. But, you know, it's worth looking in the asteroid belt for anything specially smooth and shiny. And uh, 
if we find it, then approach it rather gingerly. There was actually quite an interesting drama documentary, um, fictional um, drama on uh, BBC television earlier this week, I think, about a possible alien artefact coming through our solar system. It was fiction, but I thought it was uh, well based on science. Yes, yes. Well, we, we can't figure out things like that. And, uh, um, you know, even though the chance is small, um, then um, I think it's worth a bit of effort um, from the private donors to actually have a programme to look for it. And, and in fact, I think even a bit of public money, because I think if you ask um, people coming out of watching some science fiction movie, would they be happy if a bit of the tax from that was hypothecated to search for real aliens? I think a lot would say yes. And so I think... We need to be apologetic for spending a bit of uh, the, the scientific budget on things like that. Although I should say that's not being done at all at the moment. I'm sure there are some other questions. I can see a hand there. Let me pass a microphone over. Hello, Martin. Um, you, you've just talked about your enthusiasm for or, or preference for technological exploration as opposed to human exploration uh, and I can see the logic of that but all of that will depend on artificial in intelligence and else at other times you've expressed worries about artificial intelligence can we trust the astronomers or the 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 people to keep the uh, the artificial intelligence in its box or ca can we draw boundaries around this artificial intelligence and keep it only for space exploration? Well, hello, Stephen, very good to be in touch and thank you for coming. Um, and uh, uh, I think, uh, as, as you know, there are concerns about um, uh, artificial intelligence getting out of its box and uh, doing things which are misaligned with human interests. Um, uh, I tend to uh, be skeptical about that. I think uh, for a long time we um, need to worry less about artificial intelligence than about human stupidity. So I, I, I don't. <laughs> but, but so beyond that, um, uh, I think um, AI is less of a danger out in space than it could be on the Earth. Um, so uh, I, I don't worry too much about um, uh, the AI that would be used um, uh, in in these. Um, exploring missions um but the main point of course is that is the huge cost difference yeah. um you, you you send them out you don't need to bring them back they don't need six months worth of food and etc etc um and so it's uh, you could send literally thousands for the cost of a, a human expedition um so that that's the reason i would i would favor it and um uh, and i think a lot of them will fail in a number of ways but i think that failure won't be damaging to us so um it's not something that worries me very much. Uh, Lee here from um, Pristine Dark Skies. Hello, Martin. Um, oh, by the way, um, Jay Tate sends his regards from the Space Guard Center. Oh, right. I, I, I'm really sorry because I know it's only two miles away and I'd, <laughs> I'd have certainly visited again if I'd been with you. Um, as an analytical chemist, I'm very interested in, in what meteorites can tell us about life in the universe. Um, can you say anything about recent developments in that field? Well, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in that, but certainly one is finding very complicated organics, um, and some of which are, are claimed to have uh, uh, needed some sort of a biological origin. We don't know about that. But of course, um, one of the, the big clues um, is going to come from meteorites. But actually, one one thing I should have said when I talked about looking for alien life in our solar system, I emphasized that um, it was important to look at these planets, uh, at these moons like uh, Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, and Europa, a moon of Jupiter, where people say there could be some some life uh, swimming around underneath, underneath the, the ice. Um, and um, the, the reason that that's so important is that um, if we could show that life had originated twice in our solar system, that would immediately say that life couldn't be a rare fluke. It must exist in a billion places in our galaxy. So that would be a tremendous discovery that the, if the transition from non-living to living 
had happened twice independently, uh, then it would be something that couldn't be a rare fluke. <clears throat> but, the, but the reason it's relevant to your question is that um, discovering evidence for that there was once life on Mars doesn't have the same compelling conclusion because, as you know, um, it's possible for that meteorites can go from Mars to the Earth or even vice versa. So if we found evidence for, uh, for organic materials in a meteorite, um, then it wouldn't indicate an independent origin. In fact, uh, you could say maybe we're all Martians, maybe the life started on Mars and then came to Earth on a meteorite. Um, so um, uh, between Earth and Mars, there could be exchange of material. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's why the study of meteorites is important to understand how that happens. Whereas if we find evidence for something organic on a moon at Saturn or Jupiter, then that would definitely attest an independent origin. And that would be the epoch-making discovery that the origin of life was a common phenomenon. Thank you. Camilla. Um, hello. I just want to, because we know we're discovering more and more about how other um, creatures and plants and organisms on the Earth have very, very different ways of perceiving and different kinds of consciousnesses to ours. Yes. Um, and that's inducing some humility, I think. How would you define intelligent life? Because obviously it's going to be defined by our human limitations. I wonder if there was any sort of, because I, I can't feel it's just in, indicated by technology, but um, or technology as a sort that humans produce. Well, I, mean, I think for just the reason you mentioned, um, it's very difficult to define it because it's it's not just one parameter, all kinds of different kinds of intelligence. We know that are really from, from animals and birds and, and octopuses and all that. So, so you can't put it all on a scale, um, and um, but I, but I think um, the technological civilization you can define. You can do uh, because you could define um, um, sort of entities that weren't alive, which looked as though they've been constructed and uh, risen artificially. And so I think if you find a, a, an artifact which uh, um, clearly couldn't have arisen naturally, um, then that would be. Uh, a fairly strong bit of evidence that there was somewhere some kind of in intelligence which has a technological capability. But I completely agree with you that uh, um, we, we, there may be lots of intelligence that we couldn't we couldn't even recognise. Mm. But I think if, if we if we see something um, which looks very strange, I think we could sometimes be confident it was something that hadn't arisen. Naturally, and so that would be important to the fossil, as it were, of some uh, some kind of technological intelligence. But we should be completely open-minded about the um, uh, the kind of intelligence that could exist. And of course, um, although this is a digression, perhaps I could make the point that um, uh, uh, as a scientist, uh, we know there are many things we don't yet understand, and which we hope we will understand. But it's quite possible that there are important aspects of reality which no human will ever understand. Just like a monkey can't understand quantum theory, there may be very important aspects of re reality which uh, humans will never understand. But I think we've got to accept that uh, it's rather remarkable that uh, our brains, which haven't changed very much since they evolved to cope with life on the African savanna, um, those brains have been able to understand quite a bit about the micro world of nuclear physics in the quantum world and something about the cosmos far away from everyday experience. But uh, although we've been able to make a lot of progress, uh, there may still be concepts and phenomena that we are completely unaware of because our brains aren't up to it. Christine. Hello. Um... Hello. Uh, I'm very fascinated by the sort of idea of whether a biological evolutionary phase is an absolutely necessary part of developing intelligence or whether you're 
now saying that <laughs> since there may be aspects of reality that we can't understand at all, mm. maybe that's not even so. Right. It's sure I was assuming that, but you're, you're quite right. There may be some things quite beyond our, our, our um, uh, comprehension, which do manifest the effects of intelligence, uh, but didn't originate biologically. Uh, I, I completely agree with that. And, and of course, um, biology is, um, is a subject which um, uh, uh, in itself poses great mysteries. I mean, uh, uh, when, when, I, when I talk to big scientific audiences, I always say that uh, uh, physics and astronomy are the easy subjects. Um, compared to biology, because um, uh, a, an atom or a star, uh, both of them are very simple compared to even a, the uh, smallest living organism. A single insect has layer upon layer of structure, far more complicated than a star or a galaxy. Um, and of course, uh, um, there is a huge challenge to understand um, the insects and the small organisms in terms of chemistry. And of course, when we get to the brain and consciousness, that again may be entirely beyond us. And so the um, difficult challenges of science um, are in the biological world, as far harder than anything in the physical world. And of course, it could be that um, um, AI will help us because um, uh, uh, as you know, AI can, um, Think much faster than us, and therefore can learn to play games of chess and things like that very quickly, and uh, and beat human players. And uh, and uh, I'm hopeful that there are um, ways in which AI can actually help us with science. Um, it's already helped us to understand the shape. It's called protein folding, the shape of protein molecules, which is important for biology. Um, and um, uh, I'm hopeful that perhaps um, uh, some of the theories in physics. There's something called string theory, which is a sort of uh, idea which might lead to unification of the micro world of the quantum with the mega world of gravity. Uh, this is a theory which um, uh, involves geometry in 10 dimensions, which we can't really very easily envisage. And so it's possible that there is a theory of that kind, but the maths and the geometry is too hard or a human in a lifetime to work through, but which um, may be uh, analyzable by a machine, which is just, which can learn so much faster, just like these machines learn to beat world champions in Go and chess after just three hours of playing against themselves. Um, so it's possible that um, uh, we'll be able to, to feed in the axioms of some theory. And um, <clears throat> a few hours later, it may spew out the correct mass for the electron or the correct strength of gravity or something. So we would know it if it was, the theory had something correct, but we may never know exactly how it did the calculation. It may be too hard for a human to do in her lifetime. So machines um, can, in principle, I think, help us uh, to uh, um, analyze very complex uh, geometry or very large uh, data sets and all that. So that's the good news about machines. And I know in the past you've um, written somewhat pessimistically about the future of life on Earth. Do you still hold that view? Do you think we will reach for the stars eventually? Have Make use at least of those six billion years the sun's giving us? Well, I don't know. Uh, can I have plug my, uh, my new book that came out last month called uh, If Science is to Save Us? And uh, uh, this, this book covers a range of topics about how science is organized as a scientific community. Um, but the main point it does is reiterates that um, uh, science um, empowers us to, uh, um, to create a better world for everyone, for better health and uh, clean energy and all that stuff. Um, but on the other hand, it empowers individuals um, to uh, cause massive damage. Um, and uh, the reason it's so serious is that whereas you can't, can't have a sort of lone weirdo building an H-bomb in his bedroom, uh, building an H-bomb demands big facilities and we can have a, a international verification from 
atomic energy agency, etc. Um, that's not the case for cyber and biotech. Mm -hmm. And in particular, um, there's a techniques developed in the last 10 years um, called gain of function experiments, which can make um, viruses more virulent and more transmissible than natural ones. This was done for the flu virus 10 years ago. There was a big debate about whether these experiments should be published, etc. But they can be done, and they can be done for the coronavirus um, and, and others. Um, and um, the equipment that's needed for, for these is dual use equipment, which is readily available in university and industrial labs. And so my worst nightmare is that uh, one can, um, uh, is that uh, there'll be just one or two people uh, who uh, have malign intent um, and um, uh, will uh, create and release a dangerous pathogen, mm -hmm. um, which is even harder to deal with than the uh, naturally emergent pandemics, which we know are hard enough. Um, and so I, I regard um, this um, and the fact that technology empowers individuals in a way they never were in the past as a big challenge. And um, um, bioengineering, as I just mentioned, is one, um, but of course, cyber attacks when um, it's possible to shut down the electric grid in a country or something like that. And um, I think the um, challenge here is that um, there are three things we would like to preserve. Uh, one is um, uh, liberty, the other's privacy, and the other's security. And it's going to be very hard to preserve all three because one such weirdo is too many. I worry about the sort of person um, who uh, uh, is an eco ecology fanatic who thinks there are too many humans in the world, and let's kill off a few. And uh, we can't tolerate even one person like that. <laughs> and so I think um, we're going to have to move towards um, a society where we have to accept greater surveillance and invasion and privacy. Uh, otherwise, it will be too dangerous. So, so that's my gloomiest thought for this century. Can we can we survive without too much intrusion? Um, given that, uh, um, the, 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 as, as I put it, the um, the village idiots in the global village have global range, and so we can't be as tolerant of them as of traditional village idiots. So that's that's. Uh, so someone says something more cheerful. I don't want to end on such a <laughs> On that cheerful note, yes. Well, I, I gave you a chance to uh, plug the latest book anyway. Yes. <laughs> um, I, think... Also, uh, I think um, <clears throat> climate change, etc., is is on our minds at the moment. And, of course, um, technology um, is able to uh, uh, lead us all towards net zero. Um, and, uh, and one extra gloss I would put on this is that um, it's not enough for us to um, achieve net zero in the, uh, the global north, that's Europe and North America in particular. Um, we've got to think about the global south. And the global south, um, uh, of course, hasn't created much CO2 now, and uh, uh, its per capita energy emissions are about a tenth of what ours are. <laughs> um, but um, the four billion people will be in the global south in 2050, and I mean India and sub-Saharan Africa mainly, um, they really are going to need more energy than they have now if they're going to develop. And what we've got to do is to ensure that they can leapfrog directly to clean energy and not go through a phase when they are using lots of coal-fired power stations. Um, and uh, uh, so we've got, got to help them um, to uh, develop technology and bring down the cost of clean energy in all its forms and stories and the rest of it, so they can leapfrog directly to it, just as they've leapfrogged directly to uh, smartphones and never had landlines. So it's feasible, but this is a, a, a something that needs just a mega Marshall plan to help the global south. Um, and I think um, uh, when we talk about net zero, we've got to bear in mind that um, if those countries develop like China did, they would themselves be producing 40% as much CO2 emission as the world is today. And so it wouldn't make much difference if we got down to net zero if they were then producing more. That was rather gloomy too, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> that, that should be a, a political and economic goal. And uh, on the upside, if uh, we, uh, it's hard to think of a more um, idealistic aim for young engineers 
than to try and accelerate the availability of clean and affordable energy for the developing world. And so we, we can do it. I hope we can. Well, I think food production as well. Yeah. Well, we've given you the ordeal by Zoom and you've survived it very well. Thank, Thank you. you very much for giving us such a full, interesting, entertaining and informative talk. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> again, sorry not to be with you. And I hope you'll come and visit in person sometime soon. Enjoy the dark skies. Yes. Thank you very much.